Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us for session three of Chestnut Chat. Uh, we are pleased uh, to have uh, scientists from SUNY ESF in Syracuse, New York, join us to talk about the transgenic American chestnut and their work in biotechnology uh, and that realm to help restore the American chestnut. Um, we just went through a little bit of, a, of an introduction, but just to let you guys know, I am Sarah Fitzsimmons. I work for the American Chestnut Foundation out of Penn State University. And uh, I've been doing this since 2003 uh, full time. And I was an intern in 2000. So I've been, been at this for a while, not as long as Bill. <laughs> um, but uh, thank you for coming. Uh, a few housekeeping things. Um, so I am recording this. Uh, it will be recorded. If you put uh, uh, anything in the chat box, if you put anything in Q&A, it'll be recorded uh, to our panelists, Bill, Andy, Linda, uh, Lisa, you'll be recorded. And um, this will have a link available for people who weren't able to, to watch this uh, live. They'll be able to watch it a little bit later. Um, the Q&A will be available as a, as a separate download as well the chat. Um, if you have a question, um, you may put it in the chat. That's fine. We would prefer if you put it in the Q&A box. That's a lot easier for us to keep track of the questions and the answers and we keep them together. Uh, in some cases, we'll choose to answer the question. Um, we'll type out the, the, the answer to the question and you can find that in the Q&A. In other cases, we'll, we'll choose to answer it live. Um, I'll be asking the questions, but I'm going to hold all of these questions until after uh, Bill, Linda, and Andy speak. Um, if you have any issues or concerns, uh, again, please use the chat box. We'll, we'll try and get to that as we can. Um, with that, I'm going to hand over the official reins and, and hosting over to Lisa, who will introduce our guests, and, and we'll get going. Thanks for coming. Thank you, Sarah. Really appreciate this turnout. This is exciting. Um, I, I won't talk long, but I just want to welcome you to our third Chestnut Chat. We've had a lot of great response for our community to be able to virtually be together because we love talking about chestnut and its future. So thank you all for your interest and your time. Um, we are um, clocking this at about an hour, but if there's tons of questions, we'll try to go a little bit over, but not take too much of your time. Um, wanna congratulate Bill Powell, um, Andy and Linda um, for their great article that came out in the New York Times yesterday. Um, this was about a year and a half in the making for this um, for this writer. He also came down to Meadowview Research Farms and talked to our director of science. Um, but the focus was on their lab and their work. So um, kudos to all of you. Um, one caveat I did want to make: they they did talk about some of the competition and some of the past that um, was a little bit um, difficult to get through for our organizations, but I'm delighted to say that we are in very close collaboration now. Um, since I started five years ago, um, one of the first things I wanted to do was to work more closely with these fine colleagues and their amazing and promising biotech work for the good of conservation and the environmental movement. So um, I'm delighted that we have gone forth with a, um, a process called the Three Burr that was coined by Dr. Powell. Um, biotechnology, breeding, and biocontrol united for restoration. So um, all those uh, methods need to be done together, not in isolation. So uh, I think that collaboration process has been very successful and um, we look forward to working with them for years to come. So with that, thanks again for coming and I will turn it over to Bill Powell. All right, thank you, Lisa. So I was told that I should give a little bit of a uh, personal background. So that's what I'm gonna do. I'm uh... A husband of a wonderful wife and I uh, have two uh, grown sons, uh, no longer in the house, but uh, still uh, connect with them through playing settlers over the web right now uh, while we're stuck at home. Um, my educational background, I basically started uh, with a, um, well, I'm a veteran from the um, Air Force and I used that GI Bill to start my college career um, first started as a pre-vet and then decided I didn't like to cut up animals and uh, I had a very good uh, teacher who was in uh, molecular biology who got me interested in that. Uh, thought about um, ways that we could actually make plants so that you don't have to use pesticides on them, that they can defend themselves. Uh, so that interested me a lot. And um, so that's the direction I went. I went to Utah State University and there I met uh, Dr. Neil Van Alpen, where I first was introduced to the American chestnut tree. 
Uh, before that time, I really didn't know a whole lot about chestnuts other than the psalm, chestnut drove down on the open fire. Um, but in that lab, I learned about um, hypovirulence, uh, where you have a virus that attenuates the uh, fungus so that the tree can survive. And during that time, it was great because I learned a lot about the mechanisms of um, how the fungus attacks a tree. And that will play out later uh, in my career uh, quite significantly. Um, from there, I went and had, did a postdoc down at University of Florida, worked with uh, Dr. Corby Kistler on a different fungus uh, called Fusarium oxysporum. But then I was very fortunate to get a job up here at uh, the SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry where I could then return back to working on chestnut. When I was up here, I met uh, Dr. Charles Maynard, where we um, started collaborating. And the collaboration really uh, got started from a visit from uh, some people from the uh, newly formed New York chapter of the American Chestnut Foundation, Herb Darling, Stan, and Arlene Worsig. Uh, they came to our campus and met with Chuck and myself and asked us, is there a, a way we can use some of the more modern techniques to make a blight resistant tree. And um, you know, the, the chap, the, uh, the national was doing a very good uh, back cross breeding program, but we wanted to kind of incorporate some of the newer techniques. Uh, and Chuck and I said, sure. And, and that's where we actually got started. And of course it's been a long haul. Um, my expertise is more on the molecular side, the uh, pathology side, um, trying to find the gene that will uh, confer blight resistance. Chuck's side was more the, um, forestry, tissue culture side, um, and trying to figure out um, how do we propagate these trees? How do we get a gene into these trees? Um, and it was a very good collaboration. Um, Chuck is now retired and um, I am uh, continuing on with this. So I'm just gonna give you a little uh, background on my expertise, things that I think are, are very important that everyone should know. Um, so I just got a couple, a few slides here that I just wanna show, whoops. And I started at the end instead of the beginning. Sorry about that. Um, let me just do this. Okay. Um, let me see. Wait a minute. I guess I'm not sharing the, the show yet, right? Let me share my screen. Okay. This one, share. Okay, can everybody see that screen, hopefully? Yep, it looks uh, good. Thanks, Okay, Brian. great. So one thing I always like to start off with is that this is a project that literally, literally hundreds of people, well over hundreds of people, um, have contributed to. So this is not just me. This is really a team effort by uh, many, many different people. And one slide I like to always present in my talks is this slide of why is GE or genetic engineering useful for restoration? And I'm not, I don't put it on here to say it's the best method. I don't put it on here to put other methods down because the other methods are great too. I just want people to understand what genetic engineering has to offer that's kind of unique and, and very useful for restoration. And I'll just start off by saying that um, you know, the trees that we want to restore need to be adapted to the forest that they are coming from, okay? And one, one trait that I like to point out is the trait of uh, tree height, or, you know, American chestnut is a canopy tree. The closest one to that would be the European chestnut, uh, also a canopy tree. Both of those are susceptible to chestnut blight. The other chestnut trees, the other species of chestnut trees, uh, tend to be much shorter. Um, only about you know a half to two thirds the height of a typical American chestnut. So you know one of the ways you can make a resistant chestnut tree is to breed with these resistant varieties. But you're not only going to move over the genes for um, the resistance, but you're also moving all the other genes over to adapt them the trees to their own location. So what I need you to know is that chestnut has a lot of genes. It has around thirty thousand gene pairs. That means half from one parent, half from the other. And if you were to make a hybrid of these, uh, such as the Dunson chestnut that you can buy, buy at Walmart, about half those genes in there would be for, um, from the American, half from the, the Asian species. And um, so you have this competing network of genes. 
we have some groups of genes that are saying, make me tall, and some genes that are saying, oh, keep me short, you know? And um, you mix them together, and what you get is something usually in between. Um, and, and that's okay. That's okay if you're doing an ornamental tree, if you're doing an agricultural tree, something like that, that is fine. But for a restoration tree where you have to reach the canopy, where you have to compete with the other trees in the forest, that's not okay. And that's the reason why the American Chestnut Foundation actually instituted a back crossbreeding program to try to regain those traits that make it more adapted to the forest, okay? But uh, genetic engineering has a unique uh, way of doing this. And I just wanna use my book example. Um, let's say the genes in the tree are like the words in a book. And this book describes the American Chestnut. Again, if you did a hybrid, half those would be describing an Asian species and its adaptability to um, where it came from in the world. The other um, half would be for the American. So you get somewhere in between. But if you're gonna do genetic engineering, what happens is you have a book and all the words are the original, okay? The original for the American chestnut. And I'll just pull out a passage from a, a book. It says, it says in this passage, it's very exciting that season to roam the then boundless chestnut woods of Lincoln. So everything's in here is about chestnut. And what we do in genetic engineering is we just add a couple words to that. So now everything is still the same, um, reading about ch American chestnut, and then it goes, it's very exciting that season to roam the then boundless, light tolerant chestnut woods of Lincoln. So what we're doing is making a very small change. We're not adding in all those other genes that we then have to get rid of and therefore, the tree should be totally adapted to a four. So you get 100% American chestnut with blight tolerance. So that's the big advantage with genetic engineering. Now, there's going to be some disadvantages, which I'll tell you just in a minute, um, that we have to go back to breeding to, to deal with. But what gene do you put in there? Well, there's a lot of options. Uh, the one that seemed to work the best for us is a gene that encodes an enzyme, oxalate oxidase. It comes from wheat, but it's actually a ubiquitous enzyme. Um, if you look at the three sisters, uh, the, the main uh, crops that grow well together from the Haudenosaunee Indians, um, you got squash, corn, and beans. Two of these actually have oxalate oxidases in them. Okay, so if you look at uh, some of the published literature and you look at where oxalate oxidases can be found, you find it in all kinds of cultivated foods, uh, crops. So you eat this all the time. It's also found in a lot of wild uh, plants, as well as fungi, mosses and even some bacteria. So this gene isn't anything new to the environment. So that's the gene that we're actually putting in. And what it does, it basically detoxifies an acid that the fungus uses to attack the tree. And we know this is actually from hypervirulent studies where they found that hypervirulent isolates of the fungus can't produce this acid as well as the virulent form. So that kind of gives the first clue that this acid was important. Um, but here's a way you can actually get rid of that asset without having to use a virus to do so. Um, so you just give the tree a gene that can make this enzyme. This is not a pesticide, and that's very important. It does not kill the fungus. So if you're not killing the fungus, you're not killing off and, and only letting the ones grow that can overcome this type of resistance. So it's going to be a very stable type of resistance. So even the ones that um, can't overcome this still survive and replicate and, and uh, maintain into population. Um, so, so less selective pressure to overcome the oxide oxidase gene, and now they can coexist. Now, how much resistance is actually there? Well, it's actually very similar to the Chinese. So on left, there uh, is a stem from the Chinese chestnut that's been infected with um, the blight fungus. On the right is a wild type American infected with a blight fungus, and you see, the big difference there on the left, you got a callus, you got the uh, infections being stopped. On the right, you have sunken canker, the tree dies. In the middle is the actual one with the enzyme being produced, the oxalate oxidase. And you see it's very similar to the Chinese with just minimal damage. So there's not no damage, but there's this minimal damage and the tree survives. Okay, so one of the disadvantages with genetic engineering is that you start off with a clone, okay? All the trees are genetically identical. And so you have to use breeding to get the diversity back into the population, the population that now contains your light tolerance gene. So we do this by outcrossing, and sometime I think Jared's gonna be on here and he can tell you a lot more about this. You might've heard it already. Um, but basically you take the pollen from the uh, transgenic tree, 
you outcross to wild type trees, you collect their offspring, half of them will be uh, will contain the oxogene and be blight tolerant. We have an easy assay for that. And you just keep going and you have different complements of the original both parents. And you keep going out crossing until you finally get a very diverse population. Okay, so we're gonna be big suppliers of pollen. We've already gone through three generations in collaboration with the American Chestnut Foundation. Now, one thing before I finish and pass it on to the next person, this breeding, um, this, this whole idea of, of half the offspring not containing the oxide of oxidase gene is very important for conservation. And because these trees live for 100 years, 200 years, whatever, um, let's say 100 years from now, you have a tree like this one here. You can take that tree, you can outcross it, and um, half, if this was one of our uh, original transgenic trees, half the offspring could be non-transgenic. So in 100 years, 200 years from now, we might have much better techniques so we can actually go back to the original tree and modify that as opposed to having to modify the one that we've already modified. Um, so that, that's very good for conservation. Um, so I'm just gonna end my portion here with uh, this philosophy. This is actually a quote from Robin Kimmerer from uh, our college when she spoke at the UN. It says, we humans are more than consumers. We have gifts of our own to give to the earth. And that's the way I view this chestnut project. We, we as humans, we've actually caused this, this problem with the blight because we brought the blight over from halfway around the world. Um, but so I think it's really up to us to uh, solve that problem. And that's been my philosophy, the kind of the giving back um, of these trees. Okay, so that's what I have. And let me uh, unshare my screen somewhere. Let's see, stop share. And I guess, uh, Linda, are you gonna come in next? Hi, yeah, so um, I'll give a little bit of background of how I got into the project and then I will also uh, give a small slideshow. Um, and basically um, about 25 years ago, I was a graphic artist uh, working on Long Island. Um, my family's down there, so I wanted to be with them. And um, I decided at one point, I just wanted to change my career. So I um, uh, excuse me. Um, so I found out there was a school called the Ranger School in the Adirondacks in New York, and I applied and went to the Ranger School for a year. And I still wasn't sure what I wanted to do with my life after the Ranger School. So I came to the main campus of ESF at um, in Syracuse. And I started taking classes and I took a genetics class with uh, Bill Powell and he was looking for summer help one year and I said I was interested so I started working in his lab and um, one thing led to another. I met his colleague. I became a grad student with uh, Chuck Maynard in, uh, in his lab doing uh, plant tissue culture and I loved it. So. Uh, I got hooked, I got my master's degree, and I've been working in the lab ever since. I am the lab manager now. As you can see, I am still in the lab, I'm here now. Um, the, you know, the, lab, the college has closed down partially, um, only essential personnel are here. The reason that I am here is because we have living plants that need to be taken care of. So. Uh, I've been allowed to come on campus and, uh, and, and work with my living plants and transfer them, uh, but I am limited to the amount of time that I can come in, so I'm only here, I do my, my transfers and then I leave and I work from home the rest of the time. Um, having said that, I think I'm going to start sharing my screen and See if I can get my presentation up and running. Can you see my screen? Am I sharing it? 
You are sharing your screen. You just need to hit the little presentation button to. I did. I'm getting the wheel of death. Oh no. <laughs> there was a problem and it closed. I will try that again. Okay. I'm opening up PowerPoint. Um, just a moment. Stop sharing. I am so while I'm looking for my presentation. Um, I, what I'm going to talk about today is the actual process of transferring the gene uh, into the chestnut. Okay, I think I'm, are you there? Did I lose you? Oh, no, we, we are here. Okay. <laughs> I'm trying to find my Zoom again. Uh, <laughs> It's not fun when things don't want to work. Um, I know you can see me. I... Having trouble getting back to where you are. Um, Linda, do you want me to go first? Do you need a minute? I, um, yeah, Andy, will you do that for me? All right, sorry for the abrupt transition there. Hope, uh, <laughs> hope Linda can get things figured, figured out quickly. But my name is Andy Newhouse. I'll introduce both myself and kind of my role in the project. I have some pictures to kind of illustrate both. So to start with, I have a family here in uh, upstate New York. My wife is a middle school science teacher. So we met as biology majors in college. We have uh, two kids, uh, twins who are seven and they are not identical, but uh, <laughs> they um, enjoy being outside also. And I also enjoyed being outside. I grew up uh, camping and hiking and hunting and just enjoying the outdoors um, and knew I wanted to do something with science. But my journey as a biologist begins with these guys and they look like science fiction spacecraft maybe but they are called radiolarians they're microscopic sea creatures that make these glass shells sort of and then they pile up like feet my almost miles deep on the ocean floor and it was a slide a microscope slide of these things that really kind of convinced me to to focus on biology instead of chemistry as an undergrad and it's the kind of this beauty and diversity of life really kind of captured me and has ever since. And then it was a summer research project while I was in college working on this flower. It's called Comalina. It's related to uh, things you might be familiar with, spiderwort or tradescantia. And I didn't actually work with the plants, but I worked with their DNA in the lab. And so that really kind of captured my interest also. I really enjoyed working with DNA, but didn't really want to leave the ecology, environmental science side. So thinking about grad school, I wanted to kind of combine those interests. And uh, there was a project in Bill Powell's lab working on American Elm. And so I did that for my master's degree and was able to combine some of the molecular or DNA techniques with this uh, kind of overarching uh, conservation or restoration goal. Really appreciated that. 
And while American, uh, American Elm is usually thought of as a street tree, it's also a really majestic tree, not quite as cool as the chestnut, of course, but um, it was a great project. And uh, for various reasons, it didn't continue directly after my master's. So I moved on to a couple other projects at ESF. I looked at blue lupines uh, for Carner blue butterfly restoration, and I looked at coyote populations around New York State, just a couple other projects that um, also used DNA molecular lab techniques to address kind of restoration or conservation questions. And then I uh, positioned opened up in the chestnut lab with Bill Powell again, of course. And so I jumped back in. This was about 2007, I think, that I got back into it and have been there ever since. And I loved it. And starting out, I did mostly molecular stuff. This is a southern blot looking at how many copies of the transgene were inserted. So I was looking at was doing some transformations and doing kind of the, the DNA analysis of the plant. Um, kind of transitioned into more field work and pollinations and things like that. Also other random stuff like fixing lab equipment is always fun for me. But one of the things that I developed was a, a leaf inoculation assay, kind of a, a, an approximate uh, predictor uh, of blight tolerance and relative blight tolerance in different types of chestnut trees. Um, and that was one of the first indications that we had really good enhanced blight tolerance in our Darling 58 chestnuts. Um, like Bill mentioned, uh, we've done some uh, stem assays also and kind of uh, been understanding these issues of the tree getting the blight kind of more similar to Chinese chestnut, but tolerating it and being able to survive despite the blight. Um, but what I've really focused on the last couple of years is um, risk assessments and environmental comparisons and things like that. And I'll mention that several of these are being summarized in articles in uh, the Chestnut Foundation's journal called Chestnut. Um, there's one on nutrition that was out in the last uh, issue of the journal and then there's uh, one on some of the different animal studies that's coming out in the upcoming issue. So these are kind of general summary articles um, but we've looked at a lot of different things and different ways that chestnut trees interact with the environment, with other organisms, and repeatedly we're seeing that there aren't any enhanced risks due to the presence of this transgene. And unfortunately, I don't have time to go into detail about a lot of these studies, um, but uh, I'm also focusing on some kind of larger scale or longer term projects. One of my main responsibilities in the project right now is this BRAG or Biotechnology Risk Assessment Grant project um, that we have set up plots in three different states. So Sarah is helping us with one in Pennsylvania. We also have collaborators in Virginia. And then of course, uh, some closer to our campus in New York. And this is letting us uh, kind of scale up and look at some larger, just larger scale and longer term questions, stuff that isn't possible to do in the lab or in a really small field plot. And so some of these like uh, pollination distance or dispersal will require um, approval for distribution basically. I'm gonna get into that in a minute, but it's important I think to note that the first kind of large scale plantings we're doing are these experiments and they're really going to inform our large scale restoration efforts whenever or if or when we're allowed to proceed with those. So as far as the regulatory process, um, currently everything we have planted outside, everything we move outside is all under permits from the USDA. And so these are pretty restrictive, but it allows us to do research before we have uh, the full regulatory approval. Um, but before we're allowed to distribute the trees, we have to um, work with these three different federal agencies in the US. First is the EPA, uh, who regulates pesticides. And like Bill mentioned, the oxalate oxidase isn't a pesticide in the traditional sense of the word and that it doesn't kill or repel the pest, um, but they are still regulating us because of how their law is written. Um, but 
we have uh, kind of worked out a path with them that we think will be reasonable, hopefully. Um, the FDA regulates food and feed, and so we've done several types of things like nutrition analyses, and the USDA um, regulates other types of environmental safety. They specifically focus on what they call plant pest risks. And then we'll also be um, working with Canadian regulators because the range of the American chestnut extends into southern Ontario. And since everyone asks how long until we can get the trees, our, we really don't know is the best answer because this hasn't been done before. But our best guess based on what the regulators have told us is that it might be about two to five years. And I think we've been saying that for a while, but that's, um, that's as well as we can estimate right now. I'll also emphasize at this point that the first kind of uh, formal or public part of the regulatory process should be starting very soon. That's the open comment period for the USDA uh, plant pest risk assessment. And this is a time when the USDA opens up the petition to, to public comment. They're soliciting feedback, they're soliciting um, uh, maybe questions that aren't answered in our petition or, or um, arguments to help support arguments in their points to support arguments that are made in the petition. So we'd really appreciate your support. If you're interested in chestnut trees and chestnut restoration, um, we would sure appreciate support there. And both the Chestnut Foundation and ESF will be sharing details about that and instructions and so on as soon as it starts, whenever that might be. A um, few other things that are kind of unique about our project, just important to think about. Um, that this is the first time that genetic engineering is being used for restoration or conservation. And that is really um, requiring new ways of thinking by the regulators who are used, and really by everyone else, who's used to genetic engineering being used in agriculture, where the whole point is that the fields or the, the plants are confined. They're confined to these, these uh, agricultural fields. And so the idea that it might be used in a wild plant that's intended to spread in the forest is really requiring um, people to think differently. Um, and uh, we really appreciate community involvement and support. I think that's just entirely essential that if um, the public, if, if Chestnut Foundation, if others weren't interested in this, if no one was really excited about using the technology for restoration, that and if it were just us exploring this idea in the lab, it would be interesting, but it wouldn't necessarily mean very much in terms of restoration. But um, the con community involvement and public support is, is just essential to potential success of this project. And also both working with trees and working with the federal government are slow processes. So um, this whole thing requires patience. There's also a lot of potential for using genetic engineering in general for other types of threats. You're probably familiar with some of them, emerald ash borer, I think I saw a question on that. Um, and there's certainly potential for, for similar technologies to be used on other trees, um, as well as even uh, non-tree species. Many other uh, types of environments or species are facing threats. Uh, seabirds on islands are, being threatened by invasive rodents, uh, black-footed ferrets are critically endangered by a plague, I think. Um, and of course, coral reefs are threatened by ocean acidification and warming. And so there's potential for biotechnology to help address any of these and more. It's not the only option. There might be better options in some cases, of course, but I think it's really important that we um, at least explore the potential. It's, it's a really, valuable tool to incorporate. So with that, thank you very much. And Linda, are you ready to go? I hope so, yes. I, I am back with my Zoom. Um, okay. Um, so what I am going to talk to you about is the actual process that we use to transfer the gene into the American chestnut. And the first thing I'm gonna talk about is agrobacterium. And agrobacterium is, um, 
Agrobacterium is a bacteria that is found in the soil and it is, um, it has a circular piece of DNA. You can see the circular piece of DNA and that's called a plasmid. And what happens is the, pla the agrobacterium will transfer the DNA into the plant cell and the uh, DNA tells the plant to make food for the bacterium and it will create this gall on the plant. And as scientists, we've taken that gall gene out and put, for our case, we've put in the, um, the light tolerance gene, in this case, oxalate oxidase. And what will happen is the agrobacterium will attach to the plant cell and then transfer that gene of interest into the plant cell and we will get light tolerant American chestnut trees. And Agrobacterium has been around for thousands of years. It is a natural genetic engineer, and uh, there have been genes that were found in sweet potato that uh, from Agrobacterium, and they believe that these genes have helped make the uh, sweet potato edible by humans. Um, the transformation process begins with um, extracting embryos from the tree. And if you have a chestnut, you're familiar with the burrs that grow on the tree. So about um, the beginning of July is when pollination occurs. And a month after that, we collect the burrs from the trees. And so they're still immature. We will cut them open and extract the nuts. These nuts will go through a bleaching process. We use 50% bleach um, for five minutes. And then we, uh, in a sterile environment, a laminar flow hood, which you, can, you should be able to see behind me. Um, in the laminar flow hood, which is um, forcing sterile air towards you, so it's a sterile area, um, we will cut those nuts open and extract and get those embryos. Uh, most nuts have anywhere from nine to 15 embryos in it, and uh, usually around 12. And we'll take all of those embryos out and put them on Petri dishes with a medium that helps them grow. And once they grow uh, big enough, they'll start multiplying. So you see this whole um, clump of embryos uh, is clonal. They all have the same DNA and we will mix that with the agrobacterium in a test tube. And just briefly, they will mix around in the agrobacterium for an hour, and then we will put them on a desiccation plate, which is a Petri dish, a sterile Petri dish with a sterile uh, filter paper that's slightly moistened and, um, what will happen is uh, the agrobacterium at this point is transferring over its uh, plat part of that plasmid into the cells. We will take those embryo clumps and put them in a bioreactor. And the bioreactor is just a chamber with, uh, or a container with two chambers. Uh, you can see the top and the bottom. And the bottom has a liquid medium. So it has all the nutrients that the um, plant needs to grow, but it also, in this case, will have antibiotics that will kill off any of the um, cells that haven't been transformed, and also the agrobacterium, because we don't need it anymore. And uh, the embryos are put on the top part, you can see the mesh screen, and it will get turned on, and the, there's a uh, pump that will push air in and force the liquid medium up to uh, surround the embryos. And it will turn on, we have it set with the timer, it will go on every six hours for two minutes. And it stays in this uh, bioreactor for about six to eight weeks. Then we will put it on a semi-solid medium with nutrients. And um, at this point, we have them tested to make sure the gene of interest is incorporated into the uh, genome. 
and uh, once that, that happens in Dr. Powell's lab, once I get the okay, I will regenerate them into shoots uh, by changing the concentration of hormones and salts in sugars in the medium. And after that, uh, we take the shoots, we dip them in a rooting gel, and then um, pot them up and put them in a growth chamber, then in a greenhouse, and finally we will plant them out. So that, that was my presentation. Thanks, and Linda. Yeah, and, and Bill and Andy, thank you guys so much for, for uh, sharing your stories and the science that's behind this work. Um, we have a ton of questions, as I'm sure you anticipated, and, and we did too. Um, so for those of you who are attendees, just to let you know how we're going to do Q&A, um, I don't think we're going to get to every question um, because some of these are pre-involved. Um, I'm going to try and uh, Kendra Collins, who is uh, a regional science coordinator out of Burlington, Vermont, is helping me. Uh, arrange these questions and prioritize them. If we don't get to your question, I'm really sorry. We are gonna try and answer some of them in the Q&A um, as, as typing the answers, uh, but please you know, go ahead and follow up with us uh, via email or some other method or join us for a subsequent Chestnut Chat if we don't get to your question. Um, to start out, and I think you addressed this already, but we've got a ton of questions about it and, and I think people wanna know, when can I have a tree? Bill, you're, you're muted, sorry. So as Andy said, it's, it's a very tough question to know. We've, we've been trying to predict this now for like three years um, and uh, haven't been very good at it because it's really kind of out of our hands. Uh, basically, we have put together right now a petition to the USDA. Um, they give us timelines and then they don't follow those timelines and <laughs> all the time. And uh, so it, it's hard to know. I, again, I think it's not gonna be this year. Uh, it could possibly be next year, but like Andy said, it could be in the following years. Um, so I just hope that everybody can be patient. We are trying to get through this process as quickly as possible. And I do wanna say, if you want to help us get through quickly, um, coming up, uh, supposedly soonish, <laughs> as they say, uh, is going to be the open comment period. And I think this is going to be kind of unique. I think in the past when they had these open comment periods, of course, we always have scientists chime in on that. And they usually have a big group of anti-GMO people chime in on it. But there's really not been, I think, a big uh, cohort of people that are positive for a, a particular genetically engineered plant. And I think this is going to be new this time that there's going to be a large number of people saying, we do want these trees. And I think that's going to kind of change things. It, you know, they don't, they don't take a vote on it, but I'm sure that changes their attitudes a little bit and it might help them speed things along. Uh, so we really want everybody to send in positive comments. If you have some expertise, um, use your expertise and, and comment on that particular area. Um, but again, we can't really predict um, exactly when this is going to be available. But let's put it this way too. That doesn't mean we're not producing trees. Um, we have the program with uh, Jared that we're doing our outcrossing, making a very diverse population. We are actually planting trees um, that can be then distributed once we have to go ahead. So, and we're planting orchards for production. So once we finally do have to go ahead, we should be able to get trees out fairly readily. Thanks, Bill. Uh, another question, I've, I've got a couple of people asking similar types of questions. Um, what makes Melissima and Cronata species resistant to the blight? Do they have the oxogene too? Um, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll cover this one too. So um, they do not have the oxide oxidase gene. Uh, they have some related genes uh, for proteins called germans. And I think um, up to like, uh, I think I remember 79% similarity in, in uh, amino acid sequences, but they don't actually have that activity. Saying that though, the Chinese chestnut does have some tolerance to oxalic acid. And uh, Andy's done some, some assays with this um, and other people. 
And they do have, um, we don't know exactly what gene is causing it. Uh, we know it's not oxalate oxidase. It's not a related uh, enzyme called oxalate decarboxylase. The best we can figure out so far, our hypothesis is that there's actually a four enzyme pathway um, that can break down oxalic acid. And we know at least three of those genes are in Chinese chestnut. And so we think that that might be the pathway um, that allows it to be more tolerant to the acids. So the trait is similar, different gene. Um, what can we do as ordinary citizens to help pressure various government agencies to approve the transgenic tree for widespread release? Andy, do you want to try some? I'm going to answer all the questions. Sure. Uh, like Bill mentioned, writing into the open comment period will be really important. And there will uh, be at least one or maybe two more open comment periods, probably smaller. We've been advised that this first one is kind of the, the biggest, <laughs> I guess. But um, there will be opportunities where the USDA and EPA both are actively soliciting public feedback. Um, but Beyond that, um, if you want to write to local representatives, I think that would be great if people were aware of it. Um, but local representatives wouldn't be directly involved in the regulatory process. But I think uh, the more public kind of support there is for this project, the better chance it has. Yeah. Bill, anything and to I'll add? Just, I'll just kind of add to that a little bit in that this is not supposed to be a political process but that doesn't mean there's not some politics involved. And so writing your congressman would not hurt, um, your senators and, and all, saying that, you know, asking them to support this, this project, that could be a, a big help, um, you know, beyond uh, this open comment period. And then just, you know, talking to your, your neighbors and your friends and stuff and, and saying, you know, kind of spreading the word of, of uh, the restoration that's coming and, and that, um, you know, try to get them on board and get them to join the foundation and all kinds of things like that would be very helpful. Thanks, Bill. Um, so just to let you guys know, there have been a couple of questions um, that we've answered within the Q&A box. We've, we've typed them in, so check that out to see if your question has been answered. There were several people who asked about the Dunstan hybrid. And just to let you know, Kendra Collins has uh, put in a really good link uh, to a Chestnut article, a Chestnut Magazine article about that. Um, a couple questions about CRISPR. Does CRISPR have applications for chestnut restoration and is your lab investigating that at all? Um, yes, CRISPR um, is something that we've started pursuing. Uh, one of the grad students on the project is looking into it and will be trained on CRISPR. So that's the next step. I don't know if Andy or Bill want to add to it. Um. And Andy probably knows more about this. We do have some connections with a, um, a company that really specializes in this. Uh, is it Cortiva? Is that right, Andy? The name of it? Anyway, um, so we're hoping to get some training on that. And um, the first thing we need to do is figure out how to deliver uh, the constructs to do the CRISPR. And that's what um, Josh Mott, a uh, graduate student in our lab, is doing. It's actually looking at um, microtubules that might actually be able to deliver the DNA and allow the CRISPR uh, te technology to actually unfold in, in chestnut. So, uh, Andy, do you have anything to add to that? Okay. Um, uh, we had a question in here, or a comment rather, from, from Gary. He says, TACF should, send, TACF should send the Federal Register link once they are asking for comment on this transgenic chestnut. And I just want to let everyone know we will absolutely do that. Um, the SUNY folks will absolutely do that. Um, if you are signed up for TACF's newsletter, eSprout, uh, you will get notice as soon as that public comment period opens up. So if you're not signed up for our newsletter, go to the TACF website, acf.org, scroll all the way to the bottom and say, sign up for our newsletter. And if you do, you will get um, notified of that as soon as it opens up. Um, kind of along those lines, um, I'm sure other people have a similar question. Have you had, or do you anticipate any pushback from a quote unquote anti-GMO activist? Okay. Oh, you're muted. Yeah, Good. Okay. 
Um, so yes, we have. Um, but I do want to preface this that I've given literally hundreds of talks to the public from small groups of, you know, half a dozen people to over 300 people. And I overwhelmingly get positive responses from, from uh, the research that we're doing. Uh, but that doesn't mean there isn't some opposition. There is a group uh, that is actively trying to stop our project and uh, writing a lot of things that much of it's not true um, to, to try to um, stop it. And, and I think they have a reason for it, not that they necessarily think that this restoration of chestnut is bad, but because they think of it as this is getting a foot in the door and um, that, you know, this is really going to hurt them because how are they going to argue against all GE plants when some GE plants are good, in my opinion. Thanks, Bill. Um, so here's an interesting question. Is, the gen is there genetic material taken out of the chestnut genome to make room for the oxogene? No. It, 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 it's 100% it's, uh, American uh, chestnut. They have every single gene that they started with. And that's, that's the beauty of genetic engineering, is that it has everything it needs to be adapted to its environment and into its uh, ecosystem. Um, so we're not taking anything out. What we're doing is just adding light tolerance in. Okay, um, let's see. Do the FDA, USDA, et cetera, do they run their own tests or do they only use your data with regard to their approval process? They mostly use our data. If they have questions, they can do their own tests, but that's rarely done. Um, so we're providing our own tests, but we're also providing data from outside laboratories or, or collaborators who have done tests for us. And we provide, in most cases, all the raw data. And so they can look over it um, as much as they want. I do want to mention, too, they, they do have consultants, uh, the, the US Forest Service, as well as the um, the Fish and Wildlife Service uh, both consult on, on this process. Um, it's a very different question, but I, I think let's break it up a little bit. How much does it cost to build a light chamber? Are you talking about one of the light benches behind me or like a growth chamber with lights in it. <laughs> um, let's cover both of them. Let's see, let's see what you go with uh, it. I'm not sure what the, the actual, the growth chamber, I think the last growth chamber we purchased was $50,000, $60,000 maybe. Yeah, around um, $60,000. Yes. Um, and a light bench, uh, I don't know, $1,000 maybe? So, so the growth chambers will do a lot of different things and uh, we don't necessarily have to have all that. So, so the, we have what's called a high light growth chamber, which we uh, speed up the, um, the um, production of pollen in, that we can actually take seedlings and get pollen in less than a year. Um, but we, we do that in a big expensive uh, growth chamber because we have them. <laughs> um, you might be able to actually do them uh, in other ways. In fact, I think um, uh, Dr. Clack at the uh, University of uh, New England in uh, Maine is starting to develop uh, some light racks that uh, have worked. Uh, Andy, do you remember exactly his setup? I don't remember exactly, but there are definitely ways to get highlights in semi-controlled environments um, without purchasing the whole professional growth chambers. And we'd be curious to see if uh, other people have setups do, I think. So the light uh, racks behind Linda one. are kind of homemade. Um, they're um, shop lights with really good grow light bulbs and timers. And so adding all of those things together is uh, something that can be done on your own, but um, there are also commercial options, of course. 
So kind of an interesting question. Um, and also really quick, I've had a couple of people who wanted copies of these slides. Um, I'm not sure if you guys are willing to share that. We'll talk about that later. But to let you guys know, uh, this recording will be available. So you'll be able to reference that. You'll be able to reference the Q&A in the chat after this is over. We'll share it within a week or less of this coming out. Um, next question from RP. Please comment on the phytosociological challenges associated with reestablishing restored chestnuts into present day eastern deciduous forests. So um, that's that's an ecological question. We have lots of um, ecologists who are collaborators. And actually, I think Sarah probably could answer that question better than me. Um, I don't know, Sarah, do you want to try that question? <laughs> Um, you know, I think, I, I don't know if I, this is going to touch on the sociological, I'll go ahead and start my video. I don't know if this will touch on the sociological issues, but it'll certainly touch on, I mean, one of the most interesting things about American chestnut restoration to me is how different our forests look and act than they did 100 plus years ago when chestnut was, was at its height. And so when you talk about restoration, what is it that we're restoring and to what level of um, American chestnut population are we, we restoring? Um, American chestnut didn't come into its dominance until European settlement and disturbance came through and really opened up a lot of space for chestnut to take over. So if we wanted to restore to populations in the 1600s or 1700s, that would look very different than if they did in the late 1800s when chestnut was, was huge. So there are a lot of other big differences. Um, deer are a much bigger part of the population than they used to be. There are invasive species all over the place. There are other pests and pathogens that are um, attacking our forests. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very different ball game than it used to be. Um, Andy, I know you've done a lot of investigation. Do you have anything to add? Um, sure, yeah, really interesting questions. And I think the thing that I would emphasize is that, uh, you know, we hear these numbers about how chestnut used to be five or 10 or 25% of our forests. And so when people think about restoration, they think, oh, well, then it'll be 25% of the forest again. But chestnut restoration, even on a small scale, even on a small regional scale, will take a long time. And most uh, viewers probably know that it's not easy to get chestnut established. And even once they do get established, they don't necessarily spread very quickly. So um, we're optimistic about restoration. We have some, some plans, but it's not going to be there's no conceivable way it could suddenly be back to 15 or 25 percent of eastern forests that will take a very long time so we will be learning as we go we'll be learning from the experimental plots we already have and also from wherever the earliest restoration type plantings are and whatever those look like they will inform um plantings as as if and when they get scaled up i guess um and as yeah that's enough for now. I think that's another webinar too that may, may, may and maybe we will maybe we should have a separate restoration like what is it practical silvicultural kind of a thing so let's use that to talk about it more. <laughs> um, well, I'll get people from ESF to uh, chime in on that too. Yeah yeah that'd be great. Um, all right fantastic. Um, so uh, let's do another question. Is there a document somewhere with a description of how to do the OXO leaf assay? Andy, do you want to cover that? Um, there are three different things that might be called oxalate assay. <laughs> so I think um, testing for presence of oxalate oxidase, like finding out whether a leaf is transgenic, is probably what the question's about. Um, and I think we made a video about that in conjunction with one of our uh, state chapter meetings a couple of years ago. I don't know offhand where that is, but certainly if and when we're allowed to distribute trees, we will absolutely um, include instructions. We've talked about making some sort of a kit so people can test, like if they do pollinations, people should be able to test and figure out which ones are transgenic, and that makes a lot of sense. It's not a difficult essay, um, but that's not something that we've really I mean, the kit or whatever isn't something that we've really distributed yet. The other assays would be testing leaves for tolerance to oxalic acid or actually inoculating the leaves with the chestnut blight to, to screen relative blight tolerance, but I don't think either of those are real easy at home tests. So, so that video is on, on our web pages. I think it's under the, uh, the genes uh, tab. Uh, and um, so you can see we actually had a workshop 
at one of our uh, state chapter meetings and had people uh, do the assay to show how simple it is. It's, it's very simple. The only complicated part about it is making up the solution because um, you got to make sure it doesn't precipitate out while you're making it up. So, you know, we can, I almost envisioned that we could uh, actually make some kind of little kits or at least the solution to uh, give to people that, who want to uh, test the, uh, the leaves because um, that's the only hard part is making the solution. Um, is the antibiotic selective gene tightly linked to the oxogene in the tree or is this something that's lost during subsequent breeding? Yes, uh, very tightly linked. It's what we would say it's on the same construct. So the, the DNA is connected when it's put into the tree. Basically, it would be very difficult to breed it out. Um, really quick time check. We're a little after 1230. I think what we're going to do is go to about 1245 and, and then we'll, we'll stop there. But again, if, if you have questions that didn't get answered, I think Kendra and I are going to try and keep answering questions here in the Q&A and, and please feel free to follow up or join us next week um, for our next Chestnut Chat. Um, uh, Tom uh, Clack responded. He said, hi, I use LED lights in our greenhouse to get transgenic pollen. So just to follow up on that. Um, next question, is the oxogene always expressed as if it has gene drive properties? Okay, so don't get confused with gene drive. Okay, a gene drive is a totally different system. It's uh, often used in uh, insects to control things like mosquitoes or the diamondback moth here in, in central New York. Um, and that's a system that actually gets um, driven through uh, the, the mating and the, and the propagation of the organism. Um, that does not happen with ours. Uh, we just do normal type of inheritance, uh, Mendelian type of inheritance with ours. But if you're talking about gene expression, just meaning that is it making the enzyme all the time? Our first trees, the uh, Darling 58, will be making the gene, uh, the, the uh, oxide oxidase enzyme all the time. And we've had people uh, test that to see if it's a, uh, a drag on the metabolism of the tree and everything. And it's really not that significant, so, but it does provide the resistance. And just to let you know, though, we are not just standing still here. We are looking at other types of genetic switches, which are called promoters, um, to control that so that it's not on all the time. Uh, we have one really nice one. It's called a wound-inducible promoter. It also is a pathogen-inducible promoter. So if you get a wounding or if you get the pathogen present, um, it will actually turn the gene on at that time. And we're doing tests with that, and that's actually in our pipeline. I have a graduate student working on that. In fact, he just defended his uh, thesis on that particular project. So uh, in a nutshell, don't get confused with gene drive. Gene drive is a totally different system. If you're talking about gene expression, right now it's always being made we are working on ways to uh, have it only turn on in the presence of the pathogen. Thanks, Bill. Um, so I, this is this is a tough question, um, but it's got a lot of upvotes. So from from Eric, in your wildest nightmare, what could go wrong in releasing a transgenic American chestnut into the environment? Okay, so my wildest nightmare um, is not that it's going to cause any problems in the environment whatsoever. It's that it might not be as effective as we would like it to be. Um, and, and therefore um, not really fulfill its, its original role. Of course, it's not a real bad nightmare because it will just perish if that happens. Um, so it would just be like the wild type, let's, let's put it that way. Um, so that would be my biggest nightmare. But I have no nightmares whatsoever that it's going to cause any kind of uh, problems in the forest. I can only see benefits. I just, um, Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to add that um, if that's a question regarding, you know, what's what bad can happen from doing this. Um, there's always risk with anything. It doesn't have to just be the transgenic American chestnut. It could be with anything. Um, that's been hybridized, there's always a risk. And you have to weigh the benefits to the, the, the risks to, before you decide whether you should go with it. Thanks, guys. Good, good answer there. Um, 
Have you tried chinkapins? We have a grad student who's working with chinkapin as well. Um, I don't know how far along she's got. I know she's done transformations, um, but I don't know where in the process. I don't know if Phil or Andy know how far. Yeah. So uh, Hannah um, is one of our graduate students who started a project with the uh, Chinkapin. We actually were working with the Ozark Chinkapin Foundation, um, actually putting the oxide oxidase gene into Chinkapin because it's also susceptible to the blight. Um, we kind of put that on the shelf right now and mainly because the Ozark Chinkapin Foundation has uh, said that they found some resistant trees that they're breeding and we didn't really want to compete with that program, but we have it ready or to start back up if you know that does not work out the way they are expecting. Um, here's a, a one that's been upvoted a couple of times. Any hunch on how the USDA will uh, view the application? Will it be a fairly straightforward process to approve release outside of restricted orchards? Or will they require additional hoops to jump to jump through? Or is there any guess regarding time to approve? Um, sure, I'll take a stab at that. And I guess I need to give a little bit more background first in that there are two kind of primary parts of the USDA evaluation process. And the first that I mentioned is this plant pest risk assessment. That's what we turned in our petition for. And they're looking at potential risks to other plants or to chestnuts or to environmental um, things based on the oxalate oxidase gene. And it's really hard to envision oxalate oxidase causing problems because it's so prevalent in the environment so f already. Um, and it's, it just seems very unlikely that oxalate oxidase will result in novel plant pest risks. Or it's also unlikely that American chestnut, even if it's totally blight resistant, that it would become a weed. It just doesn't spread that fast. It doesn't, I mean, it became dominant after European settlers had been cutting down forests and really changing the whole forest ecosystem for hundreds of years. Um, so planting a few chestnut trees is, is just really unlikely to, a few, a chestnut restoration project is, is very unlikely to result in this tree becoming weedy somehow. And so that's kind of the, the impression that we've gotten is that this plant pest risk assessment isn't likely to find major risks. Um, but the separate part of the USDA evaluations, what they call, a, uh, well, they'll be doing what's called an environmental impact statement. And they're looking at all impacts, positive or negative, for chestnut restoration. And again, there might, we haven't really heard of or thought of potential negative impacts directly based on the transgene. I mean, introducing chestnuts uh, as a whole will be complicated, um, as Linda said, and, but that's kind of regardless of the method. Um, so introducing transgenic chestnuts, um, it's, it's hard to separate the transgene from chestnut restoration in general, I guess. But they're preparing this environmental impact statement. And part of that is working with groups like the Fish and Wildlife Service to evaluate impacts on endangered species. And there might be benefits or there might be, or they might find drawbacks, but just that process of evaluating all these potential impacts throughout the range of the American chestnut um, and working with various local and regional and federal groups to do those evaluations um, might be complicated. Um, so let me see, where's Mary's question? Here we go. Have there been differences in how the different batches of transgenic clones have performed in the field? And if there are differences, why? Okay, um, so the gene is incorporated in, uh, when the gene goes in, um, when it's mixing with the embryo, the gene can go in one cell in one spot and in another, like there's an embryo, it has so many cells. If the gene goes in this cell, it, it may go into um, chromosome seven. Uh, chestnut have 12 chromosomes. If it goes into this cell, it may go into chromosome four. Where it goes into those cells depends on what the expression is like. 
So we keep those separate, those two cells. They will grow up into new embryos and we can regenerate them and we consider them different events. So they may perform differently in the field uh, depending on where in the, the um, genome the cell went, or the, excuse me, the DNA went. Thanks, Linda. Um, so I'm going to do one more question. Add to that. I just want to add to that. that. That's actually another big advantage with genetic engineering is that you get a variety of what's called events. And just to be clear, the, in a given event, the gene is in a one location in all the cells of that organism. Um, but a different event is going to be in a different location and therefore might have different expression patterns, but it's still the, the other events all in all the cells of that event line. Um, so this gives us an opportunity to actually look at like different levels of gene expression, which one is the best, and we can select for that. Um, and that's what we've basically done. We, we've actually made quite a few uh, transgenic events and, and whittled, whittled it down to what we think is the best one. Thanks, Bill and Linda. So I'm, I'm going to ask one more question and then I'll, I'll, I'll wrap things up just because we're, we're running out of time here. Um, so, oh, and I lost it. All right. Uh, I've shared the New York Times article with a number of friends. Are there any, okay, are there any areas in the article you three feel were either over or underemphasized? Well, I only read it once, so <laughs> I haven't really done a big study of it. Um, I read it once. I, I liked it. They did show uh, both sides, um, you know, and I knew they were going to do that. Uh, I guess the overemphasized was probably too much about me and not, a much about, not enough about our team uh, and all the people who contributed to this. Okay. Well, great. Well, well, thank you guys. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start my video. Um, thank you so much for, for joining us, uh, Bill, Andy, Linda. It's, it's been great. Um, as, as you can see, tons of interest. There's still a lot of lingering questions. We will try and get to your questions and answer them somehow. Uh, if we don't, feel free to email me, uh, Sarah, S-A-R-A, at acf.org, and, and we'll try to get you an answer. Um, uh, Lisa, do you want to tell folks what's coming up on our Chestnut Chat agenda? and and See us, see us away for the week? Sure, sure. Um, next week on May 8th, the same time, 1130 Eastern, we're gonna have a virtual tour of Meadowview Research Farm in um, Southwest Virginia. So the staff will be giving you a tour of the greenhouses and some of the orchards out there. And uh, on May 15th, we're very excited to um, have a conversation with Chuck Lavelle. He is one of our spokesmen and a real chestnut enthusiast. He's a tree farmer in central Georgia, as well as um, was a keyboardist for the Allman Brothers and uh, the Rolling Stones. So we have a rock and roll star coming on May 15th to have a conversation. So mark your calendars for that. I just want to thank Bill, Andy, and Linda for their wonderful uh, presentations. Uh, we did share a link to the three birth um, conversations that we've been having, our proposal for integrated research so you could read about how we do collaborate much more intentionally than we ever have before. Um, we all need all the tools in the toolbox to get this tree back in the forest. So um, I'm delighted to share those kinds of, that kind of information with all of you. So I hope you have a great weekend. Um, we'll be letting you all know if you're on our email lists or eSprout when the open comment period's coming up and when it opens with some great messaging and some resources and a uh, one pager on the transgenic tree and always easy ways you can participate. So please keep an eye out for that because we've had a lot of people on the foundation side of things working hard. Um, we've had a task force, a volunteer task force to get this all teed up with our constituency to ensure we have a great large quantity and good quality comments go into the USDA um, for the next um, open comment period. So with that, I'll say goodbye to everyone. Thanks so much for coming and uh, we'll see you next, next week. <laughs>